This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. Rosia Shy here with uh, another edition of the Silk Road uh, Marketplace, uh, the aftermath there, the collapse, I should say. This is the final episode of the series. This is the wrap up, if you will. We just kind of highlight um, some of the what we discussed in the series of episodes, but also some a few updates of the things that have happened since. Um, my launch of this uh, little mini series um, on the show, but before we talk about uh, before we talk about any of that, we're going to do the news. So first off, Bond villain number one, Elon Musk. Um, this article comes from Futurism. Elon Musk, 100 Tesla Gigafactories could power the entire world. Uh, in brief, Leonardo DiCaprio and Elon Musk Musk convene in his Gigafactory to talk. Lithium ion batteries, climate change, and the future of alternative energy sources. Taking steps towards a future independent of fossil fuels and more important now than ever. Uh, the Gigafactory. Uh, the Tesla Gigafactory produces lithium ion batteries supporting the Tesla vehicles and providing low cost batteries using alternative energy sources. In a recent video, CEO and founder Elon Musk was actually quoted as saying, We actually did the calculations to figure out what it would take to transition the whole world to sustainable energy. You need 100 gigafactories. Leonardo DiCaprio met with Musk at the gigafactory this past year to discuss renewable resources and the future of energy. As it relates to climate change, Leo is no stranger to the discussion about alternative energy and climate change. In fact, uh, he recently used his first Oscar acceptance speech and has the opportunity to discuss the brave realities of our climate change and, and the warming planet. Our main goal of the gigafactory is to reach and maintain net zero energy as a leader in advancement and innovation, they claim that by 2018, the Gigafactory will, will reach full capacity and produce more lithium-ion batteries annually than were produced worldwide in 2013. The Gigafactory also aims to continue to drive down the price of these batteries, financially incentivizing the use of alternative energy sources. Uh, kind of skipping down here. Uh, battery life. As put it simply by Musk in the video, the sun doesn't shine all the time, so you've got to store it in a battery. And if we're able to shift them more completely towards alternative and renewable energy sources, Musk claims, you could avoid building elect- electricity plants at all. What some people think about alternative energy, they think of outdated, bulky solar panels that lack efficiency and are a massive financial drain. However, alternative energy technology is far beyond that. As the realities of climate change set in, it is becoming more and more obvious that we cannot wait. We cannot go another 10 years using fossil fuels at the rate that we currently do and do not experience the effects. Solar cells are more efficient than ever. In fact, inspired by photosynthesis, researchers recently combined the principles of quantum physics and biology to drastically improve current solar capacity capabilities. Solar cells are no longer even necessary to capture solar energy, and scientists have created a synthetic leaf that does just that, while converting carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide. There's no question, alternative energy is the future. We will not progress without it, and as the recent advances have shown, it's becoming a more more possible or powerful option with each passing day. If Musk is right and these low-cost green batteries can help prevent a future where alternative energy is the majority, then his Gigafactory will be one of the many steps in the right direction. Uh, one of the biggest um, hurdles is, as he was talking about, is you know kind of storing energy because the sun doesn't shine all the time. And even if they found these alternative ways of generating energy, you need to be able to store the excess. And one of the things that people are talking about is utilizing these type of batteries or some type of uh, battery hold system where the excess energy of a solar panel or of, uh, a factory like this or anything like that can be stored to be utilized uh, by either machines or different periods of time, like during winter or, or different locations in the world where it's all stored and can be held and maintained and stuff like that. And that's coming from your our future world leader, I wish I'd say, Elon Musk. Internet uh, routing weaknesses could cost Bitcoin users. Um, Researchers have found that what they claim is a way to attack the the Bitcoin network using a weakness in the way the internet operates by Danny Bradbury off of Naked Security. Uh, The exploit created by researchers at a Swiss university for science and technology ETH Zurich relies on the fact that a key piece of the internet underlying technology called the Border Gateway Protocol, or BGP, is broken. The internet is a network of networks known as autonomous systems, or ADS. A BGP is used to route the traffic between the, between them. Most users will never need to use it 
where your ISP needs it to tell traffic where to go. This all works well assuming your ISP is trustworthy. Uh, this is something we talked about a little bit about fungibility and uh, Tor actually is about ISPs, particularly with Tor, how there's so many ISP, you know, basically, particularly, particularly in the States, how ISPs have consolidated and you have to, in essence, even though you're using Tor, you have to trust that your ISP is not going to be a bad actor in a way. But what is happening, but what if, <clears throat> well, what happens if it isn't? Uh, like much of the rest of the internet, BGP was developed by trusting souls, uh, collegiate types interested in solving technical problems, but operating back then in a rarefied environment largely devoid of criminal activities. These engineers developed BGP on the back of three napkins in 1989 to solve the routing problem for a network that was expanding quickly and experiencing growing pains. It was a short-term solution based on an honor system for which no long-term replacement ever came. Reading this excellent article for a lot, and we'll talk about that when we talk about um, just the internet in general. Uh, we're going to do that on a, a word from the metaverse where we'll talk about the the other other internet we're talking beyond just beyond Tor and ITP, uh, the different uh, networks that are being developed, uh, the people that have created the internet, as well as the overall internet structure, because it's important to understand the existing internet in order to understand how people are, are attempting to decentralize it. And even if you create all these decentralized um, network systems, they're still built upon a um, a broken backbone, if you will. So here we go. Uh, nearly 28 years later, in a network filled with near do wells, uh, attackers can do some nasty things using PGP. Some of them are accidental. Uh, Pakistani telecom cut off YouTube to most of the internet in 2008 when it tried to use PGP to cut off traffic to YouTube. Unfortunately, the routing configuration it, it entered uh, propagated across the world. Attacks can be even more damaging if they are intentional. PGP hijacking is common. It's a great way for an attacker with an alternative motive to get network traffic to pass through specific bits of the internet and it might not otherwise it might not otherwise see. Uh, totally forked. Uh, the research discovered that most of the traffic on the Bitcoin network tra transverse a handful of ISPs. Uh, Sixty percent of all Bitcoin connections across just three ISPs, which is you know not very good if you talk about uh, majority attack. Uh, should one or more of these ISPs decide to hijack the traffic using PGP? They can engineer two kinds of attack, the paper or worms. The first temporarily caves the Bitcoin network in two by configuring PGP to cut connections between computers in the network. This is a problem for Bitcoin's blockchain algorithm, which relies on all computers reaching a consensus together and updating a network-wide shared ledger with the same information about Bitcoin transactions. Artificially creating two groups of machines means that each group will be working on its own ledger and they will quickly become uncoordinated. In blockchain, blockchain terminology, this is known as a fork because it's like a fork in a road. Each group has happily taken its own path in the road, and there are now two. Uh, the Bitcoin network resolves forks when all computers can talk to each other again, at which point the ledger with the most transactions wins, and the alternative fork in the blockchain is discarded. An attacker with PGP hijacking capability could use that situation to their advantage by trans transacting with someone in a smaller group, perhaps sending their, them some Bitcoin in return for an online service. Only to learn, only to, only to then collapse the fork and claim that the transaction never happened. This is known as a double spin attack. There's another attack too. This one focuses on a single Bitcoin node and uses PGP hijacking to deliver, delay the delivering of the Bitcoin blocks. The Bitcoin network creates a new block roughly every 10 minutes, and th these containing the latest transactions that happen on the network. These blocks propagate throughout the network as individual nodes press them from others. This is how everyone in the network stays on the same page and understands. Who has sent Bitcoin to whom? Uh, this somewhat kind of happens with the uh, DOS attacks where you can attack uh, nodes. This is what happened with uh, nodes that have single for SegWit, single for Lightning, and single for um, uh, Bitcoin Unlimited. Um, we'll talk about that when we eventually talk about the whole uh, blockchain debate and defacle and what's going on with updating the um, Bitcoin. Um, technology, if you will, or the Bitcoin in, it, in and of itself. Uh, but before we get into there, we have to do some other discussions first. Uh, using PGP hijacking, an attacker could alter network routing to ensure that a, a victim requesting the latest Bitcoin block receives an older block, which doesn't show the latest transaction. The PGP hijacker could allow the latest block uh, through just short of 20 minutes later. This stops the victim from seeing the latest transaction on the network, and attackers can use this technique to spin Bitcoins twice, 
or to disrupt the network by targeting large numbers of nodes, potentially altering the value of Bitcoin by dam damaging confidence in the network. Whereas network participants will eventually uncover the first attack, the second attack would go completely undetected, the research researchers point out. None of this is a fault in the Bitcoin protocol per se. After all, the internet and its associated protocols such as PGP are simply the rails on which Bitcoin and many other services run. If anything, we can blame the Bitcoin's economic patterns for exaggerating, exaggerating, exaggerating the problem. The concentration of Bitcoin mining in China, while, while over half of all Bitcoins are mined using Chinese mining pools, has gone long ways towards worsening what would otherwise be a theoretical issue. I think the whole Bitcoin mining uh, in China thing is going to end up resolving itself by the end of the year, just by the nature of the way things are moving. States are moving to cut college costs by introducing open source textbooks. This comes from Quartz. Uh, every cost associated with higher learning has steadily increased over the past decade, but none more so than the college textbooks. While tuition increased by 63% between 2006 and 2016, and housing costs increased by 50%, the cost of textbooks went, by, went up by 88% according to the data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, let's see. Uh, initiated in Maryland and New York are initiatives in Maryland and New York are attempting to curb those costs by adopting open source copyright free test work. Uh, the University System Maryland recently announced that they would be giving out 21 mini grants to seven community colleges and five public four year schools. The grants will go to facilitate facilities who are adopting, adapting, or scaling the use of OER or open educational resources in fall 2017 through higher enrollment courses where quality OER exists, according to the announcement. Open educational resources are material like electronic textbooks that typically use licenses that are far less restrictive than traditional copyrighted textbooks. That means they can be limitlessly duplicated and distributed to students and may even revised to suit the needs of a given class. Uh, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology was a pioneer of this approach when it began making its course material open to the public in 2001 using Creative Commons licenses and borrowing the ethos of open source programming. Although the mini grants are only $500 to $2,500 each, the effort in Maryland is ex expected to save 8,000 students up to $1.3 million in the fall of 2017 semester alone. That's a significant amount, which is a drop in the bucket where students in the state spend on textbooks each year. Since 1978, the cost of textbooks has risen 812%, outpacing even the cost of medical services and new housing, the announcement says. Nationally, students spend an average of $1,200 a year on textbooks, with Within Maryland alone, two-year and four-year students spend over 223 million textbooks. Another big investment in open educational resources came in the budget passed in New York State last year. The news was somewhat buried by the fact that the budget included free tuition for New York students whose families make up to $125,000 a year. But the state will also be putting $8 million into open resource material over the next fiscal year. As the cost of textbooks can be prohibitively expensive, the budget also invests $8 million to provide open educational resources, including electronic books, to students at SUNY and, and CUNY, according to the budget announcement. As the state's direction, SUNY and CUNY will use the, budget, the, the funding to target high enrollment courses, including general education, to maximize student savings. This represents an important new flux of cash for New York's open educational incentives, which the State University of the New York system has already been investing for five years. They're just, they, these are just the most recent developments of growing trend. Many other states have begun adapting open educational resources as well, and if initiatives are successful, we probably expect them to continue. Uh, there's not much to comment on that. I think that's a great, I think is much necessary. I think the more um, education becomes open source and maybe actually returning to the fact that it used to be uh, free to attend, to attend universities in a number of different states, uh, I think things will be much better as far as educational systems go um, for this country, particularly when we have to deal with things like um, automation and things of that nature will allow people to be able to re-up their skills and, and change jobs, if, they, if you will, at a much easier pace. Uh, Brave New Coin uh, has this article called The CME Group Files Patent for Comprehensive Cryptocurrency Derivative Systems by Luke Parker. Formerly known as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Group, CME Group is the largest, most diverse derivative marketplace in the world, handling an average of 3 billion contracts worth approximately 1 quadrillion annually. I actually do not think that was economically possible to have a quadrillion 
dollar. I've seen trillions bounder around, and that's even very difficult to um, phantom, but quadrillion. The company recently published a U.S. Patent and Trademark Office application describing a comprehensive system for a derivative contract system allowing cryptocurrency miners to offset risk. Uh, this is a statement that's in the article. While there is a financial risk involving in mining operations because of potential rewards, Bitcoin miners undertake these risks, hoping that the value of the mined Bitcoins will exceed the miners' costs and provide a reasonable return on investment. Uh, while mining costs are generally known up front, estimates Estimated income generated by a miner operation can be extremely difficult. There is uncertainty involved in predicting how many bitcoins a given miner computer will mine over time. Uncertainty in terms of how much the mined bitcoins will be worth in terms of legal tender, and uncertainty in trying to predict what the bitcoin difficulty factor will be in the future. Uh, derivative contracts will allow investors to hedge these risks by providing offset compensation in case of an undesired event, and can be used to allow miners to hedge risk associated with a virtual currency's difficulty factor or with the expected yield of computer performing mining operations. Ugh. I have mixed feelings about bringing the derivative concept into the cryptocurrency space. A lot of people believe it will bring and generate, and it's true because it's done it for other economic platforms, um, bring money and investment into uh, the cryptocurrency space. I mean, that's what the ETF that the Wolgoski twin, twins were trying to, um, the Facebook twins were trying to, do with their the ETF uh, they were trying to create and get passed, but the whole purpose of the, the creation of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in and of itself was to allow for individual freedom, financial freedom, and I just feel that bringing old business, if you will, or old financial concepts um, from a fractal reserve monetary system into this a completely different type of monetary system, um, it's just silly and dumb and it seems like we're just almost in an essence playing a game of musical chairs, if you will. Um, the article goes on, but this is just something that they're doing. I'm not sure if this will pass. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, counter offers and the fact that, that maybe they might not be have a legitimate claim to patent this patent. But, you know, more and more businesses are making the attempt to patent things within the cryptocurrency space. Uh, God Miners and Paycoin Head Josh Grazer pleads guilty to fraud. This comes from Bits Online. The God Miners, uh, Miner CEO Homero, Homero Joshua Garza has reportedly pl- pled guilty to wire fraud and a deal to wrap up a criminal case brought by the SEC. Sentencing will take place at a hearing on June 1st after further interviews with victims. It seems likely that Garza will spend time in prison. Others who work with Garza, including former God Miner CTO Joe Mordecai and Zine, uh, Zen Miner head Eric Capuccio will not were not charged. The FBI sent letters to, to identify victims on April 10th, assigning individual numbers and promising further updates. And there was a copy of a, an article about this. Uh, the Gaza's long running saga. Uh, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission charged Gaza with security fraud and operating a Ponzi, Ponzi scheme in December 2015. The charges stem from Garza's involvement with gold miners, which included failed cryptocurrency Paycoin, cloud mining site ZenCloud, and exchange Paybase and CoinSwap. Today's new uh, reference only to the criminal case, Garza and gold miners are also are also defendants in a civil suit de- dealing with the same incidents. News of the plea were posted on the Bitcoin Talk Forum by user um, Allen. 1980s, who has been assisting the FBI and Department of Justice in their investigation. Uh, Garza's activities go back several years. However, the SEC case specifically covers the period from August to December 2014, when the defendant took in about 19 million USD, mostly in Bitcoin, from over 10,000 investors by selling cloud mining contracts called hashlets. And the recently most hashlets sold were not backed by any actual control. Allegedly operated a fraudulent mining pool called Zen Pool, which also never existed but paid its premiums to guiders from payouts from other cryptocurrency mining operations. Perhaps the well known of the Gaza projects, however, was Paycoin, launched in 2014. It too was a multi layered with several named concepts. It involved new digital wallets called hash stakers, and a hashlet owners were invited to upgrade and hold Paycoin. The SEC said hash stakers and Paycoin were attempts by Ga and Gaza to prolong the Ponzi scheme and prevent Ga miners' collapse. Cryptocurrency enthusiasts from the period recall being hounded by passionate Paycoin proponents online message boards. 
Any criticism or warning about God or his currency will be withdrawn virtual army defenders. On God's own discussion forum, our users were notified of any paycoin mentioned. Seemingly cult like it, it was never clear if the messenger, messages came from actual stakeholders or sock puppet accounts or both. Though not mentioned in the SEC complaint, uh, Gaza also allegedly promised $20 minimum price for Paycoin. However, it's never clear how Paycoin or any currency for that matter could possibly ever make such a value guarantee without a market manipulation. There's also repeated hints that the major retailers like Amazon already accept Paycoin payments, which further fuel Paycoin's hype and value. The FBI and DOG are currently seeking investors who lost money in the Gauntliner's operation and will decide on a final sentence for Gauzer after further investigation. So we'll do an update when uh, sentencing comes. And that is it for the news. On to the update. So when we began the Silk Road Marketplace collapse, we began with kind of doing an update of what the status was for um Ross Ulrich and the trial of Silk Road and some of the things that have been going on with all the various players. Um, as of this time, there's been no ruling on um, Ross Ulrich's appeal. We still haven't heard anything about Variety Jones's extradition, but since talking about um, talking about it, uh, there's been some updates. So, uh, one of the things we talked about, you know, was the corrupt uh, agents that were um, associated with Silk Road. And while they're still in jail, there's been other agents and other uh, vendors, if you will, that have been uh, arrested because of the collapse and because of the initial Silk Road marketplace um, actions. So this comes from Crypto Coin News. A rogue Indian drug agent caught stealing bitcoins. Uh, written by Subja Das. I apologize for mispronouncing his name there or her name. An investigator from the Narcotics Control Bureau or NCB of India has been accused of stealing bitcoins frozen from a 2015 drug bust were some 470 bitcoins, approximately uh, $571,000, was were confiscated. Uh, the NCB, initially, essentially the Indian uh, counterpart, counterpart of the United States Drug Enforcement Agency, has alleged that one of its agents involved in previous drug busts has forged documents to withdraw frozen bitcoins. The case draws parallels to the D8 agent Carl Force, who pled guilty to Bitcoin theft and extortion of the Silk Road founder Ross Ulbricht during the DEA investigation of the Silk Road marketplace. Notably, the local reports add the case is the first ever instance of Bitcoin misappropriated fraud in India. The accused officer, Sabdiran Kamir Singh, was a part of an investigation that led to a seizure of psychotropic drugs in mid-2015. The drugs, primarily banned antidepressants and stimulants, were sent to the U.S.-based customers with transactions presumably made through a dark net drug market. Singh froze nine Bitcoin accounts belonging to the drug dealer in June 2015. The frozen accounts contained a total of 470 Bitcoins, approximately $110,000 at the time. A year later, the NCB checked on the status of the accounts and discovered they were untied and withdrawn by Singh. An internal investigation began. Speaking to the Times of India, a crime branch official involved with the investigation revealed, after the accused got bail from the Gujarat court in 2016, the NCP sought to report on the status of the Bitcoin accounts and learned that Singh had authorized the unfreezing of the accounts in July 2016, though a signed and stamped letter on the on NCP letterhead, and as no such authorization was given in the case, Zing came under the scanner and an internal inquiry was began against him. The investigation revealed that Zing had colluded with one of the accused drug dealers to forge official documents demanding the release of the frozen bitcoins from accounts at an unnamed bitcoin exchange. The bitcoins were released and transferred to other accounts before they were turned into fiat cash. For his involvement, Zing pocketed 50,000, or not 50, but 50% 50 of the 470 bitcoins at approximately $280 per coin in July 2016 prices, that they valued at uh, 1200 per coin. Singh has since been suspended by the NCV and is currently under arrest. An investigation of the transactions of misappropriated bitcoins and Zing's role in the crime is underway. And what else? Um, here. 
the need to liquidate complicated Bitcoin calls for new laws in Belgium. I think we talked about this briefly. Uh, Belgium's Justice Minister Coyne Greens has advised the government that the country's laws need a cut need to cover virtual currencies like Bitcoin, according to HNL. He wants the legal obligations that apply to the financial sector to apply to the virtual money, which to date has not been subject to the established law. Uh, this is from CryptoCoin News, written by Lester Cohen. Green is reportedly trying to determine how the government can liquidate Bitcoin seized in a criminal case. This includes 1,050 Bitcoin seized in two separate drug cases valued at more than $1.2 million. No established law for Bitcoin. While most of the Bitcoins can be immediately liquidated, officials do not have an established way to sell Bitcoins. Green says the law does not offer the guidance needed to address cryptocurrency seized from criminal activities because the laws were established prior to Bitcoin's creation. All of our anti-abuse legislation is based on the responsiveness of an intermediary in the financial sector and the network that we know like banks, Green's told VRT News. The legislative prize, nothing virtual virtual about the sector because it was not there at the time the legislation was written. It's necessary to change the law so that we can deal with all with abusive bitcoins. Virtual money is gaining popularity among the small investors who are looking for an alternative to their savings. Accounts in Belgium reportedly reported a uh, a Belgian news source. Virtual currencies also attract scammers who seek to extort money by promising high returns with digital coins. Moreover, the exchanges that the virtual currencies are traded on are completely anonymous, making them an ideal tool for criminals to fund CD businesses and conduct money laundering. So, Belgium has seized some coins, and now they want to be able to do what uh, the U.S. Marshal Service has done to be able to auction them um, at some type of auction mechanism that they have there within their country. And so, as... Um, Time goes on. We're going to see more, as I stated um, in this Agents of Silk Road episode, we're going to see more and more of these cases where we're going to see not only corrupt agents, if you will, because of the temptation. Um, This happens in drug cases all the time as well, just normal, regular drug cases without um, the additive of Bitcoin. But we'll see uh, more vendors are going to get busted uh, more countries having to deal with um, Bitcoin as either a virtual currency or some type of asset and addressing it and codifying it in their laws because of the different types of legal action because of uh, the cryptocurrencies association with the drug marketplace. And it would be interesting to see um, as time goes on, now that we have Japan and potentially um, Japan you know, has accepted Bitcoin as a legal tender, if you will, an acceptable legal um, payment process there in their country, and Russia considering it, and even emphasizing the fact that it will uh, help with um, fraud and uh, money laundering efforts, tracking that. I would be interested to see how other nations deal with this particular asset, not just in a positive, but also in a negative way, because of the taint associated with Bitcoin because of the Silk Road marketplace and other drug marketplaces that have come to existence because, you know, it was so successful before prior to its collapse and even after its collapse, all the other different drug marketplaces that came to existence, even the ones that, you know, you did the exit scams and things of that nature, um, how, um, People have dealt with that and dealing with that and the, the nature of the drug marketplace in itself has changed and evolved. And different current cryptocurrencies like Monero have become the acceptance. I believe their Monero is accepted on Argo, one of the drug marketplaces, um, the rise of privacy cash. Uh, how, you know, these countries are, are going to deal with this. And I think most likely by the end of this year, we're going to see a lot more legislative efforts that have been passed or being processed or being considered. Um, and um, good or bad, we're going to see just exactly come January 2018 where cryptocurrencies footing is in the, the financial world. So after we talked about, you know, Silk Road and we talked about the agent's of you know updating the trial and there there are no updates on that with Marty Jones and the players and just um 
there's not even really any more updates on the possible third corrupt agent that is um, associated with the Silk Road uh, case. Um, and again, all these different types of vendors that are uh, being prosecuted and processed because of the, the ramifications of the fact of block spies and blockchain technology and the fact that the U.S. government has that server and so they can go through and start tracking vendors and customers. Um, we started talking about the, you know, solutions, you know, the solutions and things that have happened because of the collapse. And one of those um, solutions that we talked about was the decentralized marketplace. And there's been some updates on that. So episode 14 is when we discussed this. And one of the decentralized marketplaces we talked about as a solution was Open Bazaar. And Open Bazaar is re- recently did a, a statement about different types of payments. Um, we talked about Open Bazaar um, baked in it, except only Bitcoin. But um, in this update for version 2.0, it was going to have a ship shaped, um, use the ship shaped token exchange platform, their little uh, payment platform attached it, attached into the um, Open Bazaar 2.0 framework where you can use other cryptocurrencies to pay for items. Well, um, they recently um, made a, a statement. Um, the inclusion of future payment types in Open Bazaar. This came out April 17th. Open Bazaar is committed to making global peer to peer decentralized e commerce happen. We believe in making free, making trade free for everyone, everywhere. Achieving this mission will only happen if we're adaptable and willing to honestly assess whether or not technologies we use are helping us to fulfill our mission or holding us back. For payment technology, Open Bazaar currently uses Bitcoin for transactions within the marketplace. Bitcoin is the most recognized, most secure, and most used cryptocurrency available today. It allows Open Bazaar to exist without the need to rely on third parties. There are many other cryptocurrencies available as well, but the Open Bazaar protocol and software is being built by a small group of individuals, and we've chosen to keep our scope reasonably by focusing purely on Bitcoin. However, for various reasons, we do believe OpenBazaar should be able to support mobile types of payment methods. It is possible that Bitcoin may not always be the king of cryptocurrencies. Other cryptocurrencies may surpass it, or they may be more suited for the types of transactions that OpenBazaar users need. There is a considerable amount of excitement from other Bitcoin communities to support their projects through OpenBazaar. We're optimistic about what they have to offer, and as we think Decentralized payment choices should be diverse and openly in the hands of the users. We will do everything we can to support the flexibility needed to enable this functionality in a way that doesn't su- sacrifice any of the core tenets of our projects. This includes additional documentation on how other currencies can be integrated by coin developers. We will continue to have discussions with the community on how to best create a strong user experience with multiple wallets and coins. Uh, want to get more involved? If you're interested in what the development process of the integrated your favorite coin into the Open Bazaar network uh, would involve, click here for more information, and they have a GitHub link. If you're interested in staying up to date with the new developments related to the altcoin integration, please email our community manager Jane Cloud at uh, and they have the email address. And for general updates related to Open Bazaar. And then Particle, uh, which was was sh- the Shadow Cash platform, and then it turned into Particle. Uh, even though we talked about the Shadow Cash platform um, at the time, I did my research for the decentralized marketplace. That's what it was. And then uh, mid March, they changed, and they are moving, migrating into a new platform. Um, Particle, which is going to have a decentralized marketplace and a different type of token system. Well, they just finished um, their um, funding, if you will, uh, where they funded their they had three tiers. They hit all three development mines, mile, milestones, and they converted uh, five million and some change of their SCT converted to particle, um, which leaves about about a million and some change out there. Um, they accepted. Um, uh, donations to their Bitcoin address as well as their SCD conversion address. Uh, they have 
over 1,600 participants, uh, some of them 841 bonuses, and 808 one for one swapped. Um, I'm sure more updates are going to happen. This ended uh, their funding and exchanging of their SDC into Particle ended um, Saturday, April 15th. Um, the order participate in the uh, initial offering of the Particle decentralized marketplace. You have to have a Particle token. In order to have a Particle token, you kind of have to swap it out from um, SCC to Particle. I'm sure pretty soon those tokens will be put out in the marketplace or somewhere like Shapeshift or something like that, and that will get you to participate in uh, the decentralized marketplace. But that that is an update there for both the Shadow Cache and it's talking about the privacy cache there for um, Particle it's, and it is funding. And it'd be interesting to see um, as the year progresses, you know, which one of these decentralized marketplaces are going to be very successful. Is it going to be like BitMarket? Is it going to be um, OpenBazaar? Is it going to be Particle? Is it going to be this other other uh, BitFi? Is it going to be some uh, Ethereum platform that people are attempting to develop into? Which leads into our next announcement. Um, Deal of Search, which does the uh, the uh, web crawl of open bazaar is looking into developing and seeking people that are interested in creating an ethereum version of open bazaar um, they released a statement through medium i'm not going to read all of it but i find it very fascinating all these different types of platforms that are just building out from these different concepts and seeking to get into the uh, e-commerce site with the use of uh, di different types of cryptocurrency platforms and all of this, mind you, is because of the added spotlight that the Silk Road Marketplace had put on the pressure on these different cracks and crevices of the cryptocurrency space. And as a response, you know, the, the cryptocurrency space uh, sprang into action. So Apple, which is very notorious for its um, stringent policy when it comes to uh, apps in its platform uh, is allowing uh, Jax, which is an app on, uh, is a wallet app that's on the Apple iOS store that you can now accept Zcash. Uh, they've been very stringent on the different types of uh, cryptocurrency cat, you know, uh, wallets on their platform, but even the types of cryptocurrencies these wallets, especially when they have multiple coins or tokens in them, can accept. Uh, Dash for a while wasn't able to get into the App Store, and eventually it was. And now Zcash is being accepted. And that's kind of our update for the privacy cache on that end. The only other thing is, and it's still something that's very ongoing, is that a paper, a white paper has been released that Monero transactions can actually be traced. I have personally have not yet read this uh, white paper. It was just uh, released um, like over the weekend. And I just haven't had the time to sit down and this recording. This is April 17th. No, it's April 20th. So I haven't had the chance to sit down and read the um, white paper in itself, but this is an article from uh, Altcoin Today. Monero transactions are traceable in research. Uh, the privacy-centric cryptocurrency Monero includes un unlinkable transactions in its main offering, meaning that a single coin cannot have its entire transaction history revealed. On Friday, a researcher called that assertion into question. Uh, the research paper authored by Andrew Miller, uh, Matt Motal Moser, Kevin Lee, and Arvin Narana details research into how Monero transactions obfuscate their origins. It reveals how blockchain analysis could potentially lead to Monero transactions traceable, particularly those taking place before 2017 being linked, showing the transaction history of certain coins. Cointelegraph spoke with Andrew Miller, assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urban Champaign and associate director of the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts, and one of the researchers cited in the Monero Link paper. 
and the implication of these findings. Uh, coin paragraph went in one sentence were the findings of the paper. We found that a significant number of Monero transactions, mostly transactions made in 2014 through 2016, can be linked. Can you define link for the layperson? Um, Andrew's response. In Bitcoin, each transaction points to a previous transaction, which in that is the coin that it spends. Monero is designed to obscure this linkage by including a bunch of fake coins called uh, mixins along with the real coin. Um, how would this linking be done? Does the software exist that can make this possible? Yes, the linking can be done with a really simple algorithm. Anyone with a copy of the blockchain can run this as themselves, but it seems like no one has done it yet. But this is not feasible with the current version of Monero, correct? So to be more clear, we analyze two ways of linking Monero transactions. The first one leads to conclusive linking, like we can tell with 100% certainty that a particular transaction is linked to another. This method only applies to older transactions. The second we way involves some uncertainty. There is a bias in how the mixins are chosen, and you can guess that the newest coins in the real one and the and be right much more than if you guess randomly. So I downloaded a Monero wallet right now and got some and tried to send them for transaction. How linkable can how linkable would a transaction be today? I think it's hard to speculate here. I don't want to take a guess and say that things outside was supposed to be supported by the evidence reported in our paper. If you download a wallet today and withdrew coins from an exchange today and then created a transaction to spend them, you'd probably use our ring CT in the default number of four makes sense. That means that for the transaction you created, you probably expect the attacker would have a one in five chance of linking your spending transaction to the withdrawal. But it actually is worse than that. You're closer to one half instead of one half. Now with the old transaction though, right, say I used Monero for some purchase in late 2015, those might be linkable. If you made a Monero purchase in late 2015 or even late 2016, there's ar arguably a very good chance your transaction can be linked. Whether this denominates you or not depends on whether the information the attacker has, like if they have records from where you received the coins, IG in exchange, or if they have records from where you spent the coins, IG a merchant. I know hypothetically are tough, but let's say I have bought some Bitcoins on an AML KYC compliant exchange. We exchanged it for Monero and made a purchase during that time period. One could theoretically track that purchase back to my identity. If, you, if one could seize the logs from the merchant, then almost certainly. You link to Zcash, aren't you? Aren't you? Why would anyone trust this research and dismiss it as an attempt to smear a competitor? A fine question, yes. I'm linked to Zcash and I've been a consultant for them for years as well as for as well as Tezos. I have also consulted for Ethereum and made sure to disclose this on the first page. It's tripe, but I think everyone should be distrustful of every claim and try to re reproduce the claims as much as possible. In this case, it should be straightforward. Here's what I think is going on. The reaction I've seen from Monero folks is mostly, this is not new, we've known this since 2014, with reference to the MRL reports, which discuss the fundamental problems underlying our analysis. But I don't think that anyone yet has actually looked at the blockchain to see how bad it is. I have not seen any software that does this analysis, nor seen any block of school reveal this in two hours. So, um, there's a possibility that Monero might not be as private as they think or claim to be. And it would be interesting to see with the release of this paper how. Uh, quickly a blocking score will be generated or created. Um, there's not much update on fungibility. The issue still remains. And with the ongoing debate about uh, the expansions of blocks within Bitcoin, I think fungibility is, is going to be an increasing issue for the community as time goes on. And then we talked about exchanges in episode... Uh, 117 and there's been some big canuffles that have been happening. Uh, more Bitcoin exchanges fall victim to banking problems. This is from Bitcoin.com by Kevin Helms. Following uh, Bifinex announcements to disable fiat deposits, more Bitcoin exchanges are having the same issue. The other trading platforms have also disabled Incoming USD wire transfers, signing bank accounts, and other inventory bank problems, despite problem, deposit problems spreading to other exchanges. Bitfinex is not the only big, Bitcoin exchange which has disabled fiat 
deposits. The Bitcoin exchange BTCE has also announced on Twitter that it's not accepting U.S. dollar wire transfers until the end of the month, citing a bank accounting problem. So these are all the Chinese exchanges that are having this issue. Uh, the Chinese exchange OK, uh, exchange OK Coin is also reportedly having the same issue. A Reddit user posted a message supposedly displayed a user's account stating that the U.S. dollar deposits have been temporarily suspended since Wednesday because of the issue with intermediary banks. The account further reads, please do not make further deposits as your wires may be rejected by the intermediary banks. We are now actively looking for alternatives to resume deposits as soon as possible. A few other cryptocurrency services and money service businesses are reportedly encountering the same problem as well. Third-party banks de-risking. Intermediary banks and corresponding banks are third-party banks. The terms are sometimes used interchangeable. Regardless of any slight difference, they both facilitate international fund transfers as well as transaction settlements. When Benthanex filed a lawsuit against Wells Fargo, it was revealed that Wells Fargo was acting as a correspondent bank for the Taiwan-based bank, which Benthanex used. Big banks have known to de-risk corresponding banking relationships that are considered high risk for the business is a common problem, according to the World Bank. This risk, this risk avoidance would typically occur on a wholesale basis without a case-by-case -case assess assessment of the risk associated with individual customers or the country or region involved, or as a result of analysis indicate that the business relationship as a whole was no longer profitable. Therefore, it would not be uncommon for a bank such as Wells Fargo to, server, to sever its corresponding banking relationships with other Bitcoin businesses in the same way it did with Bitfinex. And the Taiwan banks are tightening their AML requirements following Wells Fargo de-risking decision, which only affected outgoing wires. Bitfinex informed customers that all its incoming wires would be blocked and refused by its Taiwan banks. So, a lot of... So this has been always been an issue with Bitcoin. If you're not actually mining Bitcoin or earning Bitcoin or being tipped in Bitcoin or selling Bitcoin, how do you get Bitcoin? How do you get Bitcoin, period, uh, with the current financial structure overall globally? Uh, you can't buy it by money orders any longer, really. Um, I think pretty soon you're not going to be able to do any cash deposits and with the, these further restrictions of wire transfers, how are you going to obtain this cryptocurrency, really? Or any cryptocurrency, for that matter. According to an article by Whale Calls, banks in Taiwan do not previously have strict AML KYC requirements, but they were enough to comply with U.S. regulators. However, the U.S. has recently revived these requirements, and the U.S. Department of Financial Crime Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, is now requiring business operator, operating as a money transmitter to report any suspicious activity. So the U.S. is, is the one responsible for this type of crackdowns, which just ripples across all, all um, you know, the financial sectors in general. Um, there's a link, a couple links here. One's about the Benfinex um, shutting down the U.S. Uh, deposits, but the other is that it's been two months that um, exchanges withdrawals have been blocked in China, and some people are deeply concerned that there's this is going to be another Mt. Gox situation. Others are not like that. It seems that basically what it is is that these Chinese exchanges have been pressured by. Uh, the Chinese and the U.S. government to become compliant, if you will, and it's just it's just going to take time. Um, we'll see. Come, I would say by June or July, if the withdrawals and deposits aren't reactivated within that time frame, then you're going to see either lawsuits or a lot of knuffling and a lot of migration, significant migration away from Chinese exchanges into. Uh, decentralized exchanges like um, BitSquare and any that come in development. So when we began the Silk Road Marketplace collapse, we began with kind of doing an update of what the status was for uh, Ross Ulrich and the trial of Silk Road and some of the things that have been going on with all the various players. Um, as of this time, there's been no ruling on... Um, Ross Ulrich's appeal. We still haven't heard anything about Variety Jones's extradition, but 
since talking about um, talking about it, uh, there's been some updates. So uh, one of the things we talked about, you know, was the corrupt uh, agents that were um, associated with Silk Road, and while they're still in jail, there's been other agents and other uh, vendors, if you will, that have been uh, arrested because of the collapse and because of the initial Silk Road marketplace um, actions. So this comes from Crypto Coin News. A rogue Indian drug agent caught stealing bitcoins. Uh, written by Subja Das. I apologize for mispronouncing his name there or her name. An investigator from the Narcotics Control Bureau or NCB of India has been accused of stealing bitcoins frozen from a 2015 drug bust where some 470 bitcoins, approximately uh, $571,000, was were confiscated. Uh, the NCB, initially, essentially the Indian uh, counterpart, counterpart of the United States Drug Enforcement Agency, is alleged that one of its agents involved in previous drug busts has forged documents to withdraw frozen bitcoins. The case draws parallels to the D8 agent Carl Force, who pled guilty to Bitcoin theft and extortion of the Silk Road founder Ross Holbers during the DEA investigation of the Silk Road marketplace. Notably, the local reports add the case is the first ever instance of Bitcoin misappropriated fraud in India. The accused officer, Sabdiran Kamir Singh, was a part of an investigation that led to a seizure of psychotropic drugs in mid-2015. The drugs, primarily banned antidepressants and stimulants, were sent to the U.S.-based customers with transactions presumably made through a dark net drug market. Singh froze nine Bitcoin accounts belonging to the drug dealer in June 2015. The frozen accounts contained a total of 470 Bitcoins, approximately $110,000 at the time. A year later, the NCB checked on the status of the accounts and discovered they were untied and withdrawn by Singh. An internal investigation began. Speaking to the Times of India, a crime branch official involved in the investigation revealed, after the accused got bail from the Gujarat court in 2016, the NCP sought to report on the status of the Bitcoin accounts and learned that Singh had authorized the unfreezing of the accounts in July 2016, though a signed and stamped letter on the on NCP letterhead, and as no such authorization was given in the case, Singh came under the scanner and an internal inquiry was began against him. The investigation revealed that Zing had colluded with one of the accused drug dealers to forge official documents demanding the release of the frozen bitcoins from accounts at an unnamed bitcoin exchange. The bitcoins were released and transferred to other accounts before they were turned into fiat cash. For his involvement, Zing pocketed 50,000, or not 50, but 50% 50 of the 470 bitcoins at approximately $280 per coin in July 2016 prices, that they valued at uh, 1200 per coin. Singh has since been suspended by the NCV and is currently under arrest. An investigation of the transactions of misappropriated bitcoins and Zing's role in the crime is underway. And what else? Um, here. The need to liquidate complicated bitcoin calls for new laws in Belgium. Uh, I think we talked about this briefly. Uh, Belgium's Justice Minister, Coyne Greens, has advised the government that the country's laws need a cut need to cover virtual currencies like Bitcoin, according to HNL. He wants the legal obligations that apply to financial sector to apply to the virtual money, which to date has not been subject to the established law. Uh, this is from CryptoCoin News, written by Lester Cohen. Green is reportedly trying to determine how the government can liquidate Bitcoin seized in a criminal case. This includes 1,000 and 50 Bitcoin seized in two separate drug cases valued at more than $1.2 million. No established law for Bitcoin. While most of the Bitcoins can be immediately liquidated, officials do not have an established way to sell Bitcoins. Green says the law does not offer the guidance needed to address cryptocurrency seized from criminal activities because the laws were established prior to Bitcoin's creation. All of our anti-abuse legislation is based on the responsiveness of an intermediary in the financial sector and the network that we know like banks, Green's told VRT News. The legislative prize, nothing virtual virtual about the sector because it was not there at the time the legislation was written. It's necessary to change the law so that we can deal with all with abusive 
big ones. Virtual money is gaining popularity among the small investors who are looking for an alternative to their savings. Accounts in Belgium reportedly reported a uh, V, a Belgian news source. Virtual currencies also attract scammers who seek to extort money by promising high returns with digital coins. Moreover, the exchanges that the virtual currencies are traded on are completely anonymous, making them an ideal tool for criminals to fund seedy businesses and conduct money laundering. So, Belgium has seized some coins, and now they want to be able to do what uh, the U.S. Marshal Service has done to be able to auction them um, at some type of auction mechanism that they have there within their country. And so, as um, time goes on, we're going to see more, as I stated um, in this Agents of Silk Road episode, we're going to see more and more of these cases where we're going to see not only corrupt agents, if you will, because of the temptation. Um, this happens in drug cases all the time as well, just normal, regular drug cases without um, the additive of Bitcoin. But we'll see uh, more vendors are going to get busted, uh, more countries having to deal with um, Bitcoin as either a virtual currency or some type of asset and addressing it and codifying it in their laws because of the different types of legal action because of uh, the cryptocurrencies association with the drug marketplace. And it would be interesting to see um, as time goes on, now that we have Japan and potentially um, Japan, you know, has accepted Bitcoin as a legal tender, if you will, an acceptable legal um, payment process there in their country and Russia considering it and even emphasizing the fact that it will uh, help with um, fraud and uh, money laundering efforts, tracking that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how other nations deal with this particular asset, not just in a positive, but also in a negative way because of the taint associated with Bitcoin because of the Silk Road marketplace and other drug marketplaces that have come to existence because, you know, it was so successful before prior to its collapse and even after its collapse all the other different drug marketplaces that came to existence even the ones that you know you did the exit scams and things of that nature um how uh, people have dealt with that and dealing with that and the, the nature of the drug marketplace in itself has changed and evolved and different current cryptocurrencies like monero have become the acceptance i believe they're Monero is accepted on Argo, one of the drug marketplaces, um, the rise of privacy cash. Uh, how, you know, these countries are, are going to deal with this. And I think most likely by the end of this year, we're going to see a lot more legislative efforts that have been passed or being processed or being considered. Uh, and um, good or bad, we're going to see just exactly come January 2018, where cryptocurrency's footing is in the, the financial world. So after we talked about, you know, Silk Road, and we talked about the agents, uh, you know, updating the trial, and there, there are no updates on that with Variety Jones and the players, and just, um, there's not even really any more updates on the possible third corrupt agent that is um, associated with the Silk Road, uh, case um, and again all these different types of vendors that are uh, being prosecuted and processed because of the the ramifications of the fact of block spies and blockchain technology and the fact that the U.S. government has that server and so they can go through and start tracking vendors and customers um, we started talking about the you know solutions you know the solutions and things that have happened because of the collapse and one of those um, solutions that we talked about was the decentralized marketplace and there's been some updates on that so episode 14 is when we discussed this and one of the decentralized marketplaces we talked about as a solution was open bazaar and open bazaar has re recently did a, a statement about different types of payments um, we talked about open bazaar um, baked in it except only Bitcoin, but um, in this update for version 2.0, it was going to have a ship shaped, um, use the ship shaped token exchange platform, their little uh, payment platform 
attached it attached into the um, Open Bazaar 2.0 framework where you can use other cryptocurrencies to pay for items. Well, um, they recently uh, made a, a statement: um, the inclusion of future payment types in Open Bazaar. This came out April 17th. Open Bazaar is committed to making global peer-to-peer -peer de decentralized e-commerce happen. We believe in making free making trade free for everyone, everywhere. Achieving this mission will only happen if we're adaptable and willing to honestly assess whether or not technologies we use are helping us to fulfill our mission or holding us back. For payment technology, Open Bazaar currently uses Bitcoin for transactions within the marketplace. Bitcoin is the most recognized, most secure, and most used cryptocurrency available today. It allows Open Bazaar to exist without the need to rely on third parties. There are many other cryptocurrencies available as well, but the Open Bazaar protocol software is being built by a small group of individuals, and we've chosen to keep our scope reasonably by focusing purely on Bitcoin. However, for various reasons, we do believe Open Bazaar should be able to support mobile types of payment methods. It is possible that Bitcoin may not always be the king of cryptocurrencies. Other cryptocurrencies may surpass it, or they may be more suited for the types of transactions that Open Bazaar users need. There is a considerable amount of excitement from other Bitcoin communities to support their projects through Open Bazaar. We're optimistic about what they have to offer, and as we think decentralized payment choices should be diverse and openly in the hands of the users. We will do everything we can to support the flexibility needed to enable this functionality in a way that doesn't s sacrifice any of the core tenets of our projects. This includes additional documentation on how other currencies can be integrated by coin developers. We will continue to have discussions with the community and how to best create a strong user experience with multiple wallets and coins. Uh, want to get more involved? If you're interested in what the development process of integrating your favorite coin into the Open Bazaar network uh, would involve, click here for more information and they have a GitHub link. If you're interested in staying up to date with the new developments related to the altcoin integration, please email our community manager, Jane Cloud, at, uh, and they have their email address, and for general updates related to Open Bazaar. And then Particle, uh, which was was sh the Shadow Cash platform, and then it turned into Particle. Uh, even though we talked about the Shadow Cash platform um, at the time, I did my research for the decentralized marketplace. That's what it was. And then uh, mid March, they changed, and they are moving, migrating into a new platform. Um, Particle, which is going to have a decentralized marketplace and a different type of token system. Well, they just finished um, their um, funding, if you will, uh, where they funded their they had three tiers. They hit all three development mines, mil milestones, and they converted uh, five million and some change of their SCT converted to Particle, um, which leaves about about a million and some change out there. Um, they accepted. Um, uh, donations to their Bitcoin address as well as their SCD conversion address. Uh, they have over 1,600 participants, uh, some of them 841 bonuses, and 808 one for one swapped. Um, I'm sure more updates are going to happen. This ended uh, their funding and exchanging of their SDC into Particle ended um, Saturday, April 15th. Um, the order participate in the uh, initial offering of the particle decentralized marketplace you have to have a particle token in order to have a particle token you kind of have to swap it out from um, scc to particle i'm sure pretty soon those tokens will be put out in the marketplace or somewhere like shapeshift or something like that and that will get you to participate in uh, the decentralized marketplace but that that is an update there for both the shadow cash and it's talking about the privacy cache there for um, Particle it's, and it is funding. And it'd be interesting to see um, as the year progresses, you know, which one of these decentralized marketplaces are going to be very successful. Is it going to be like BitMarket? Is it going to be um, OpenBazaar? Is it going to be Particle? Is it going to be this other other uh, BitFi? Is it going to be some uh, Ethereum platform that people are attempting to develop? into 
which leads into our next announcement of Duo Search, which does the uh, the uh, web crawl of Open Bazaar, is looking into developing and seeking people that are interested in creating an Ethereum version of Open Bazaar. Um, they released a statement through Medium. I'm not going to read all of it, but I find it very fascinating. All these different types of platforms that are just building out from these different concepts and seeking to get into the uh, e-commerce site with the use of uh, di different types of cryptocurrency platforms. And all of this, mind you, is because of the added spotlight that the Silk Road Marketplace had put on the pressure on these different cracks and crevices of the cryptocurrency space. And as a response, you know, the, the cryptocurrency space uh, sprang into action. So Apple, which is very notorious for its um, stringent policy when it comes to uh, apps in its platform, uh, is allowing uh, Jax, which is an app on, uh, is a wallet app that's on the Apple iOS store that you can now accept Zcash. Uh, they've been very stringent on the different types of uh, cryptocurrency cat, you know, uh, wallets on their platform, but even the types of cryptocurrencies these wallets, especially when they have multiple coins or tokens in them, can accept. Uh, Dash for a while wasn't able to get into the app store and eventually it was, and now Zcash is being accepted. And that's kind of our update for the privacy cache on that end. The only other thing is, and it's still something that's very ongoing, is that a paper, a white paper has been released that Monero transactions can actually be traced. I have personally have not yet read this uh, white paper. It was just uh, released um, like over the weekend. And I just haven't had the time to sit down and there's a recording. This is April 17th. No, it's April 20th. So I haven't had the chance to sit down and read the um, white paper in itself. But this is an article from uh, Altcoin Today. Monero transactions are traceable in research. Uh, the privacy-centric cryptocurrency Monero includes un unlinkable transactions in its main offering, meaning that a single coin cannot have its entire transaction history revealed. On Friday, a researcher called that assertion into question. Uh, the research paper authored by Andrew Miller, uh, Matt Motal, Moser, Kevin Lee, and Arvin Nanana details research into how Monero transactions obfuscate their origins. It reveals how blockchain analysis could potentially lead to Monero transactions traceable, particularly those taking place before 2017 being linked, showing the transaction history of certain coins. Cointelegraph spoke with Andrew Miller, assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urban champaign and associate director of the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts, and one of the researchers cited in the Monero Link paper and the implication of these findings. Uh, Cointelegraph went in one instance were the findings of the paper. We found that a significant number of Monero transactions, mostly transactions made in 2014 through 2016, can be linked. Can you define link for the layperson? Um, Andrew's response. In Bitcoin, each transaction points to a previous transaction, which in that is the coin that it spends. Monero is designed to obscure this linkage by including a bunch of fake coins called uh, mixins along with the real coin. Um, how would this linking be done? Does the software exist that can make this possible? Yes, the linking can be done with a really simple algorithm. Anyone with a copy of the blockchain can run this as themselves, but it seems like no one has done it yet. But this is not feasible with the current version of Monero, correct? So to be more clear, we analyze two ways of linking Monero transactions. The first one leads to conclusive linking, like we can tell with 100% certainty that a particular transaction is linked to another. This method only applies to older transactions. The second we way involves some uncertainty. There is a bias in how the mixins are chosen, and you can guess that the newest coins in the real one and, the, and be right much more than if you guess randomly. So I downloaded a Monero wallet right now and got some 
and try to send them for transaction. How linkable can how linkable would a transaction be today? I think it's hard to speculate here. I don't want to take a guess and say that things outside was supposed to be supported by the evidence reported in our paper. If you download a wallet today and withdrew coins from an exchange today and then created a transaction to spend them, you'll probably use our ring CT in the default number of four makes sense. That means that for the transaction you created, you probably expect the attacker would have a one in five chance of linking your spending transaction to the withdrawal. But it actually is worse than that. You're closer to one half instead of one half. Now with the old transaction though, right? Say I used Monero for some purchase in late 2015. Those might be linkable. If you made a Monero purchase in late 2015 or even late 2016, there's ar arguably a very good chance your transaction can be linked. Whether this denominates you or not depends on whether the information the attacker has, like if they have records from where you received the coins, IG in exchange, or if they have records from where you spent the coins, IG in merchant. I know hyp hypothetically are tough, but let's say I had bought some bitcoins on an AML KYC compliant exchange. Exchange of Romero and made a purchase during that time period. One could theoretically track that purchase back to my identity. If you if one could seize the logs from the merchant, then almost certainly. You link to Ccash, aren't you? Aren't you? Why would anyone trust this research and dismiss it as an attempt to smear a competitor? A fine question. Yes, I'm linked to Zcash and I've been a consultant for them for years as well as as well as Tezos. I've also consulted for Ethereum and made sure to disclose this on the first page. It's tripe, but I think everyone should be distrustful of every claim and try to re reproduce the claims as much as possible. In this case, it should be straightforward. Here's what I think is going on. The reaction I'm seeing from Monero folks is mostly, this is not new, we've known this since 2014, with reference to the MRL reports, which discuss the fundamental problems underlying our analysis. But I don't think that anyone yet has actually looked at the blockchain to see how bad it is. I have not seen any software that does this analysis, nor seen any block of school reveal this in two hours. So, um, there's a possibility that Monero might not be as private as they think or claim to be, and it would be interesting to see with the release of this paper how uh, quickly a blocking score will be generated or created. Um, there's not much update on fungibility. The issue still remains, and with the ongoing debate about uh, the expansions of blocks within Bitcoin, I think fungibility is, is going to be an increasing issue for the community as time goes on. And then we talked about exchanges in episode uh, 117. And there's been some big canuffles that have been happening. Uh, more Bitcoin exchanges fall victim to banking problems. This is from Bitcoin.com by Kevin Helms. Following uh, Bifinex announcements to disable fiat deposits, more Bitcoin exchanges are having the same issue. The other trading platforms have also disabled incoming USD wire transfers, citing bank accounts and other inventory bank problems, despite problem, deposit problems spreading to other exchanges. Bitfinex is not the only Bitcoin exchange which has disabled fiat deposits. The Bitcoin exchange BTCE has also announced on Twitter that it is not accepting US dollar wire transfers until the end of the month, citing a bank accounting problem. So these are all the Chinese exchanges that are having this issue. Uh, the Chinese exchange OK uh, exchange OKCoin is also reportedly having the same issue. A Reddit user posted a message supposedly displayed a user's account stating that the U.S. dollar deposits have been temporarily suspended since Wednesday because of the issue with intermediary banks. The account further reads, please do not make further deposits as your wires may be rejected by the intermediary banks. We are now actively looking for alternatives to resume deposits as soon as possible. A few other cryptocurrency services and money service businesses are reportedly encountering the same problem as well. Third-party banks de-risking. Intermediary banks and corresponding banks are third-party banks. The terms are sometimes used interchangeable. Regardless of any slight difference, they both facilitate international fund transfers as well as transaction settlements. When Bimfinex filed a lawsuit against Wells Fargo, it was revealed that Wells Fargo was acting as a correspondent bank for the Taiwan-based bank, which Bimfinex used. Big banks have known to de-risk corresponding banking relationships that are considered high risk for the business. 
is a common problem, according to the World Bank. This risk, this risk avoidance would typically occur on a wholesale basis without a case-by-case assessment of the risk associated with individual customers or the country or region involved, or as a result of analysis indicate that the business relationship as a whole was no longer profitable. Therefore, it would not be uncommon for a bank such as Wells Fargo to sever to sever its corresponding banking relationships with other Bitcoin businesses in the same way it did with Bitfinex. And the Taiwan banks are tightening their AML requirements following Wells Fargo de-risking decision, which only affected outgoing wires. Bitfinex informed customers that all its incoming wires would be blocked and refused by its Taiwan banks. So, a lot of so this has been always been an issue with Bitcoin. If you're not actually mining Bitcoin or earning Bitcoin or being tipped in Bitcoin or selling Bitcoin, how do you get Bitcoin? How do you get Bitcoin? Period. Uh, with the current financial structure overall globally, uh, you can't buy it by money orders any longer. Really, um, I think pretty soon you're not going to be able to do any cash deposits. And with the, these further restrictions of wire transfers, how are you going to obtain this cryptocurrency, really? Or any cryptocurrency, for that matter? According to an article by Whale Calls, banks in Taiwan do not previously have strict AML KYC requirements, but they were enough to comply with U.S. regulators. However, the U.S. has recently revived these requirements, and the U.S. Department of Financial Crime Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, is now requiring business operators operating as a money transmitter to report any suspicious activity. So the U.S. is cra- this the one responsible for this type of crackdowns, which just ripples across all, all um, you know, the financial sectors in general. Um, there's a link, a couple links here. One's about the Benfinex, um shutting down the U.S. Uh, deposits, but the other is that it's been two months that um, exchanges withdrawals have been blocked in China, and some people are deeply concerned that there's this is going to be another Mt. Gox situation. Others are not like that. It seems that basically what it is is that these Chinese exchanges have been pressured by uh, the Chinese and the U.S. government to become compliant, if you will. And it's just it's just going to take time. Um, we'll see. Come I would say by June or July, if the withdrawals and deposits aren't reactivated within that time frame, then you're going to see either lawsuits or a lot of knuffling and a lot of migration, significant migration away from Chinese exchanges into uh, decentralized exchanges like. Um, BitSquare and any that come into development.